her example um, became an inspiration symbolic as much as anything else. When the Church of England had its own debate over the ordination of women priests and again her name was recalled when um, much later the church had its debate over the ordination of women as bishops uh, and for me her life is a brilliant and inspirational example of how the spirit of god is not limited by gender or by circumstance unapologetic from premier unbelievable one of the people you mention is John Sentamu, who I know you obviously worked quite closely with, and you write about his prayer vigil for peace in 2006. I mean, why does that feel so significant today in light of everything that's going on in the Middle East? Uh, John Sentamu uh, is a huge inspiration to me. I was fortunate enough to work with him first in Birmingham uh, when he was Bishop of Birmingham for a couple of years there, and then subsequently uh, when he was Archbishop of York and one of the things that, um, one of the reasons why I'm so grateful for that opportunity to have worked uh, with him is the way his own discipleship uh, shaped my own. Um, that as a spiritual mentor in witnessing the way that he took uh, the discipline of prayer so seriously, the way that he was open to the work of the Spirit, and the way that he every day, understood the truth that there is nothing that is impossible for God and he held that out to be the case and was true and his uh, fast his fasting and prayer for peace in the Middle East uh, which uh, I talk about in the book was born from him saying coming into my office one day and saying you know um, I'm praying about this and it just feels like my prayers are hitting the ceiling and I need to do to respond to where the Spirit's leading on this. Now, he was due to go on holiday three days later with his wife, Margaret, on pre-booked summer holiday, uh, and they were due to go off. Uh, but he said, I just can't go with the world like this, with um, this lack of peace. So he cancelled his holiday. And he announced that he was going to be fasting and praying publicly in the Minster, set up a tent and invited people to come and join him, invited people to do something. Because I think, you know, we look even now at the situation in the Middle East and we can feel powerless. We can feel powerless in the sight of violence as we witness brutality and death. But part of what John Sentamu did then was to remind us that we are never powerless, that there is an option to be able to go and pray, to uh, go and call before God for peace, to light the candle, to come to pray, to stand with others and to lift our voices and hearts in prayer uh, and to implore peace uh, in a broken world. And um, seeing him, do that was such an example and um, that prophetic act that calling people back to the power of God and to the character of God um, Ruth we could do with having uh, more John Sentamese around uh, prophets uh, for peace yeah yeah, we absolutely could. I mean, and I guess one of the things you mentioned is that the third Sunday of Advent is called the Sunday of Joy. And, and you talk about um, Cardinal Van Thuen speaking about what joy means in, in just a really dark situation. Would you say just a little bit about him and, and why the third Sunday of Advent is called the Sunday of Joy? And do the other Sundays have names as well? Well, I, you'll know that as we as we journey through Advent, it's marked in various ways in churches that we light candles each week in relation to remind us of the journey and the story as we build up to Christmas for uh, the patriarchs, for Mary, for John the Baptist. We uh, do that. But also alongside that is what's known as Gaudete Sunday, uh, which uh, for those people who are into such things, uh, such as Church of Espens, and I must admit it's not something I'm particularly knowledgeable about or do, 
but it's also a Sunday when there's a lot of pink worn on that day as part of uh, the celebration of Gaudete Sunday. And I think, uh, yeah, the Pope, uh, Pope Francis was very good on this when he wrote uh, about joy and the need in some ways to rediscover joy, the difference between happiness and joy. But actually, joy as being one of the fruits of the spirit is a deeply um, spiritual gift. That means that our joy comes not from, in some ways, uh, external context, but actually through a deep knowledge of who God is. That that's where our joy and rejoicing is to be found. And uh, the story of Cardinal Vantuan in the in the book is just a remarkable example of how someone in solitary imprisonment for years was able to maintain a joy in Christ and who uh, Christ is. Uh, Justin Welby uh, talks about him uh, in his book Reimagining Britain and um, that story that he tells in there is of uh, Cardinal Bampan being in prison and celebrating communion with a single grain of rice and a single drop of rice wine and lifting that up to celebrate and commemorate uh, the life, death and resurrection of Jesus within that act and to proclaim hope in the midst of darkness. And that is where our joy is rooted. It's where our joy is to come. And in some ways it means joy as well as being a gift from the Spirit, something to be paid for, is also can be a choice. It can be uh, something about where we place our love, our focus, our understanding, how we, the lens through which we see and not only the rest of the world, but the rest of our lives, uh, rooted in that understanding of who God is and the joy and the utter privilege it is to know the love of God through Jesus. Uh, one of the people in your book is Stormzy, who has brought faith into the mainstream, certainly for, for many, many young people in this country and, and further afield. I mean, what do you think was so powerful about his Glastonbury performance? You, you describe him in your book as an unlikely evangelist, which I think many people would probably echo your words. I think part of it, is, uh, a lot of this, I think, has to do with culture. So Stormzy uh, tells uh, his own upbringing, uh, which was one uh, of living in an urban environment, an urban estate where the reality of gangs, violence and drugs was something that was all around. And uh, having brought, been formed in some way by that environment, that has shaped who he is and shaped uh, how then he speaks of God and to whom he speaks. Um, and one of the things that I think I admire about him is his uh, desire to be authentic in terms of who he is. So rather than to um, speak of God uh, and then deny, you know, uh, some of the things that have happened or do happen in his life that seem ungodly, he says, well, actually, this is who I am. And it's bringing together both a declaration in uh, God and his victory and living out faith and giving glory to God uh, as he opens that you know wonderful set at Glastonbury by saying you know we're gonna uh, we're gonna go to church now and we're gonna give God the glory we're gonna give God all the glory there's no uh, doubt about the authenticity of Stormzy's faith but alongside that you have for instance in his first album uh, the title uh, gang signs and prayer, that you have the uh, visuals on the front of the album of uh, people gathered at the Lord's Supper with a storms in the middle, but those around him who were almost taking the place of the disciples in balaclavas. And so you have not so much glorification, I think, 
of violence, but a recognition of faith. Uh, and one of the things, you know, just um, reading his story um, that really struck me was, A, the way he has been shaped so strongly by his mother's example and his mother's prayers, and the way that he walks the walk. You know, he um, has given so much money away from the money that he has earned because of his faith because of what he understands he has received to be blessing and his understanding that when blessings are received they need to be shared and uh, people can question and i understand why the language or uh his particular approach and you know the legitimate questions to ask. you know there aren't that many storms he tracks you can play in church but when it comes to living out your faith, he really is doing it in a way that many who perhaps question his language uh, could learn from in terms of what he does. Um, yeah. Um, and his mum, you mentioned his mum. His mum was super powerful. I mean, she wasn't at his Glastonbury performance because she was in church on her knees, wasn't she? She was uh, speaking in tongues as a prayer warrior. There is a fantastic track, actually, that Stormzy has done with J.P. Cooper called Mama's Prayers, which just all talks about how how much of their lives have been dependent upon their mother's prayers, how when they walk out onto the street, they've got an army surrounding them because of their mother's prayers. And even within there, quite a funny line, that, you know, I'll tell my grandkids, if they ever mess around, they're going to have to face their grandmother's prayers. And so that sense of... <laughs> uh, that sense of him being shaped by that. And there was a recent um, BBC interview he did with uh, Louis Theroux. And again, a language warning on that. But where you see him with his mom in church weekly, not just on Sunday, but actually going there for praise and prayer session to go and be uh, shaped by that and his commitment to it. Would you share just a little bit about the Reverend Dr. Florence Lee Tim Oi? Um, because she has got an amazing story and she clearly impacted so many people, didn't she? Uh, Florence was uh, the first woman in the Anglican communion to be made and ordained a priest. And as is so often the way when uh, these seismic changes happen, it was born of a practical need. Uh, she was serving in uh, occupied Hong Kong and Japan, uh, in Macau, uh, where she was a deacon. And her own story is that of someone who came to faith uh, later in life, uh, slightly later, not as a child, but whose uh, journey to ordination uh, was one that had to be worked for and prayed for and was long and hard. Uh, but having responded to a call at a church meeting uh, one day, which was uh, effectively based around uh, Isaiah 6, you know, whom shall I send? And her heart responses, here I am, Lord, send me. Um, that she trained for ordination, was ordained deacon. And then at a time uh, during uh, the war and conflict, when people were unable to receive communion from uh, priests because they couldn't get there, uh, they physically couldn't cross uh, lines, uh, uh, military lines in order to do it. She was ordained priest in order to go and serve and celebrate communion and to be able to uh, enable Christian sisters and brothers and Ruth, in the years that followed, she had a torrid time uh, after the end of the war. She was placed in re-education camps uh, under the Chinese system. Um, she was taunted for her faith. Her vestments were ripped. Um, she really went through serious times of suffering. But eventually... Uh, was able to leave China. She relocated to Vancouver and in the years that followed was able to act as an inspiration, uh, particularly to women 
those who are campaigning for uh, women to be ordained priests, but also women who are saying we can uh, celebrate uh, the fact that this woman was ordained priest, and you know what? Uh, the world didn't fall apart. People were blessed. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, there was no uh, thunderbolt from heaven uh, saying, how dare you? Uh, and actually, uh, her example um, became an inspiration symbolic as much as anything else. When the Church of England had its own debate over the ordination of women priests, and again, her name was recalled when, um, much later, the church had its debate over the ordination of women as bishops. Uh, and for me, her life is a brilliant and inspirational example of how the spirit of God is not limited by gender or by circumstance. That uh, God gives gifts to women and men through his spirit. And our call is to respond to those gifts. And I don't think there is any of the gifts of the Spirit that uh, God gives that are limited by gender. And Florence's story uh, really underscores that. Aaron, I wish we could speak about every single person that you mentioned in here, but we would be here for hours. Um, so you must go and buy it because it's such a brilliant book. Please do go and buy a, po a copy of Stick With Love or multiple copies and give them away. Um, but just as we finish, Aaron, one thing that I'd love to know is it, it, in a world where, you know, there just seems to be darkness everywhere, all these horrible stories we hear on the news, wh whatever's going on in our own personal lives as well. What does a child in a manger say to us in those circumstances? I think it's the ultimate promise of hope. It's that uh, we are not abandoned, that God does not leave us alone, that uh, in Christ we are invited into a full relationship with God, that Jesus knows what it is uh, to be tempted, to suffer, to mourn, to be betrayed, to be tortured, and in the midst of it to forgive. And through his life and death, life, death and resurrection, we have the opportunity to enter in to a full relationship with God, where the riches of that grace are something we can then share. Uh, I think for me, that hope that uh, the triumph of Christ on the cross means that violence and death and tragedy never have the last word. And actually the coming of uh, Jesus into the world is the beginning of uh, the answer that we know where things end and we know that it ends with the triumph of Christ and that the final word belongs to him and that in the end, love wins. Bishop Aaron, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas with great to spend time with you and God bless you. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. For more shows, resources and our newsletter, visit premierunbelievable.com.